Hi everyone, I'm Rose Martin and we are right around the corner in Roanoke with Liz Long. Liz is a USA Today best-selling author of young adult and fantasy, including her recent The Brighton Duology. When she's not writing, she's working as a magazine editor, directing the Roanoke Regional Writers Conference and the annual Roanoke Author Invasion. She describes herself as a writer, a photographer, a dreamer, and a Twitter stalker, and says that we could put the word nerdy in front of any of those, and we've described her perfectly. I know I liked her when she told me she enjoys Prosecco, she's obsessed with her dog Fisher, and head over heels for her husband, who's a musician. Let's welcome Liz to Right Around the Corner. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for having you so, me. <laughs> oh, we are so excited. Thank, Thank you for you. inviting us to your home Absolutely. right here in Roanoke. I'm so glad to host you and with the perfect glass of Prosecco. <laughs> Absolutely. That makes it even better. <laughs> Absolutely. Makes it even better. So getting to know a little bit about you, you've got a wonderful little dog, Fisher, who greeted us when we came in today, which was wonderful. <laughs> and your husband, who's a musician, what does he play? He plays guitar and harmonica, and then he's also a singer. Wonderful. I bet things are fun at your home, right? Yes. We got the creative arts on lockdown in this household. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. So you started uh, writing, I was reading in second grade when you had a wonderful story <laughs> about a unicorn and unfortunately someone beat you out by writing about soccer. How could that happen? <laughs> You've done your research. Um, yes. Yeah, so like many writers, been writing my whole life and it was something that really came to fruition when I self-published in 2012. So what happened in second grade? Uh, you know, that's a great question. It's been so long ago. <laughs> I okay. I really remember. I remember really enjoying writing that unicorn story, mm -hmm. though. <laughs> Do you still have it? Uh, my mom probably has it in a scrapbook Of course somewhere. she does, right? <laughs> of course she does. Well, and then I was also reading that you were always part of the yearbook and the newspaper. Yes. And that was kind of fun. Did you search out your own stories? Or did they feed you stories and you printed them? For, for yearbooks, certainly it was assigned. I was the academic um, editor, so mm -hmm. I handled all things classes and nerdy things um, in high school. And then for college and the newspaper, I definitely pursued my own um, things that I was interested in. Uh, we had a secret society on campus that I definitely did a little in-depth research on. Had a letter slipped under my door telling me to stop digging too deep type of story. Oh, that sounds <laughs> fascinating. So what was the secret society? So we have Kai on Longwood campus, mm -hmm. and so they're um, a society, you know, a secret society, obviously, of members of students who are leaders in the in the community, as well as um, they get, you know, great grades and they're part of the clubs and, and, you know, just really kind of passing on the spirit and leadership of Longwood. So you get this letter underneath your door. Does that have you back off or does that have you dig a deeper? I think it had me dig deeper, but, uh, you know, at the time it, made, it did make me a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I could see that. I could see that. So tell me why you proclaim yourself at everything nerdy. Um, well, I guess if you're going by the standard, I'm super into like Marvel and comics and superheroes. Um, you know, maybe not necessarily a math person, but I mm -hmm. certainly love all things um, sort of geeky because I love that culture and I love that we're all able to have a lot of fun, for example, at Comic Cons or, you know, events like that, that really um, everybody dresses up and, and everybody's part of the group. And so um, it's really great to feel like part of a community where no matter where you are, you have somebody there who's going to be into the same things you are and you can just make best friends really easily. And you could just be yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you had a superpower, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have to say that um, like one of the characters in one of my books, she's a transporter. And so she saves on a lot of travel time. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't have to get in a car and spend hours in the car trying to get somewhere. Just poof, you think about it and you're there. Yeah. Where would you go? Oh, um, is Hawaii cliche? I would probably no. go to the beach. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a transporter, you could go anywhere Absolutely. anytime. Or like a secluded cabin, you know, in the mountains where, you know, nobody bothers you and there's plenty of Prosecco in the fridge. Right. And that would be also with Fisher and your husband? Naturally. Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> That's fun. So um, where did the whole idea of being a fantasy writer come about? Did you li live a fantastical childhood? Were you always creating new and interesting characters? Sort of, yeah. I feel like you've, you've really studied up here. Um, no, so, you know, in my childhood home, we had um, 12 acres of forest. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, many times when my mom couldn't find me, I'm, I'm hiding in a room reading or I'm out in the woods. And so I'm, you know, having these wonderful thoughts of, you know, fairylands and, mm -hmm. and wizards and all sorts of, of great stuff. And so I really have been interested in the fantastical since I was a little kid. There's something about escaping to, um, you know, a different kind of world that is always excited me. And so I'm really glad to be able to write worlds for readers now that they can escape too. No matter, you know, you can have a great day, you can have a bad day, and either way you can still run away to somewhere exciting. 
And that's interesting. Who are some of those writers that you read about that let you escape to those fantastical worlds? Well, Hogwarts is, is top of the list sure. with J.K. Rowling, um, of course. But um, Marie Lu is another author who I really admire and, and you know hope to emulate. She um, has a wonderful legend um, series. And so she writes about fantastical things. Um, and she also participates in the DC Icon series. So young adults, um, Batman and, and Catwoman and Wonder Woman. And I think those are just really cool because not only do you get um, the aspect of the superheroes, which I love because mm -hmm. I'm nerdy, but also you get that young adult aspect of an origin story. And so that's something that they're telling a story that hasn't been told before, despite the fact that so many people are familiar with that world. And so I yeah. think that's very exciting to do a spin on something that exists, but you make it your own. And you've made it kind of cool to be nerdy. And also when you think about, this is a tough age group to write for. The, yes. the, that yes. young adult, that, that preteen, that teen, that right. they want to not go with you know, books that are too young, but just they're not ready for some of the other books, or they're not interested, right? right? So what was your goal in trying to get them just to pick up a book, or were you trying to send some subtle messages? Um, you know, I think I never really set out to send subtle messages, but every once in a while I kind of, I'll go back occasionally and read over something and realize I've sort of slipped something in. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, for me, it really is about having teens or anybody who loves young adult pick up that book. Um, you know, I think it's really important that it doesn't matter um, what genre it is, as long as it gets you reading, I think that that's the most important piece of, of the puzzle. And so as long as you're enjoying it, you know, I think that that's key. Um, and so for teens, it's really important to be authentic. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you can't be too cool and you can't be very logical, right, teens? I don't know if I could be cool at all. I, <laughs> I was never cool. I don't cool. think I would have to worry about too cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was ever cool. Um, but, you know, that's okay. That's what, yeah. you know, helps me connect and, and remember the way that, you know, I felt in high school. Um, and I think it's just really important to be authentic and let teens know that there's always a place for them somewhere. And that's tricky, though, because... You know, they're, as they're growing up, the content has to be a little tricky. Right. And, you know, throughout your books, you handle some, some really delicate issues. And so I'm wondering, with, with some of the issues you tackle, how do you stay current with knowing, like, they're not going to think that this lady, she has no idea what <laughs> we're talking about. Old. Right. <laughs> she's trying to appeal to us. So how do you, how do you stay current with what they're interested in and well, the things they're thinking about? That's, I read a lot of young adult. Um, I, the ones I, the books I just named, I'm still reading those. I just mm -hmm. finished one of those last week. Um, I also watch a lot of TV and movies that may be considered geared towards teens. Um, you know, whether it's a book to movie adaptation mm -hmm. or, you know, I watch a lot of, um, the teen shows, you know, um, actually the Blood King which we've talked about um, was in the Teen Choice Awards back in August. And so that's something that was great to watch because it's so exciting yeah. seeing these teens pick up this book and, and know that hopefully they go home and read it and get to find a little place. Well, let's shelf. let's go there for a minute. Sure. So how did the Blood King end up in the Teen Choice Awards? My PA, my personal assistant, had mm -hmm. a connection to um, the company that helps work with that. And so they got us in those bags. So out of the 24, 25 authors she worked with, they took six of us. And so it was a little hodgepodge of... Um, you know, you had dystopia, you had romance, you had contemporary. And so I was very lucky and honored to be considered to be part of that bag. Congratulations. Thank you. That's Thank really you. neat. What kind of feedback did you get from any of the kids who picked up the books or their parents for that well, matter? Well, um, at the, you know, at this time they just picked them up. So I haven't heard too much, but it's really exciting to see them holding up those covers and a lot of them, yeah. um, you know, hopefully we'll see them on Twitter and I can stalk them. And <laughs> right. <laughs> and do you do any kind it. of focus groups with kids to see, um, you know, how the storyline's going? Do they like it? I don't, but that's a wonderful idea that I might have to start implementing. Okay. <laughs> I did, um, for Heroes for the Trilogy, I did, um, in the later stages, talk to some high schoolers at Patrick Henry High School um, here in Roanoke, and so we were talking about different ways to market it, and they helped me with a little bit of a grassroots campaign, getting it out on the street, and mm -hmm. making sure that it's in all the local high school libraries. One to many. <laughs> so let's say that they pick it up and they're in school, or a teacher wants to use it, or what kind of message would you like them to pull out of one of your books to say, you know what, let's share this with young adults, let's share this theme, or let's share this idea with these kids? I think, you know, and this isn't just for mine, but for many books, but definitely the theme that I find in the supernatural circus in a superhero in her city um, is about belonging and not mm -hmm. even necessarily family like blood family, but finding mm -hmm. a family where you can be yourself, where you mm -hmm. can be whoever it is that you want to be, even when other people are telling you not to. And I think that that is probably the most important thing because we all want to belong somewhere, no matter what age we are. And so I think it's especially important for teens to understand that there is a place for them. We just have to find it. You know, that's really true because we've all been to the place where we didn't belong. 
You know, school can be tough. Growing up can be tough. Being an adult can be tough, right? (laughs) So there are those times that we all feel like maybe we're not belonging. But I think I what I'm taking from you saying is that it's just it's going to be okay. Yes. You know, be you, and and the world will find you. I hope at the end of the day that's what they take away. Absolutely. So the heroines in your book, you've got you've got heroines, you have villains, you have the secondary type of characters. How do you? start uh, a book? Is it the story or the characters that come first? Well, I've had it go both ways, but I would say, you know, 90% of of when I write, it's usually the character that comes to mind first. Um, You know, and typically it's what is, it's usually her. So what is her personality? Um, And then of course, what is the problem? What is it that she wants more than anything? And then what's in the, what's standing in the way of that? Um, And so, you know, it starts with her and that problem and Mm -hmm. the goal and then building around it, which is really fun to world build. It's one of my favorite parts of the process. Is there a little bit of her, Liz Long, in any of these particular characters? Um, I would like to think that I, too, am a little sassy and brave. Um, In that situation, maybe it would be different, but I Mm -hmm. like to think that there's a little piece of me in, in um, in every female character that we have. Hmm. How about your family members? No. Mm-mm. Oh, you're you are pretty definitive about that. No. Like, no, they read them and they are not gonna no, make it. No, it's funny. Every once in a while, I'll have a character who might be named the same. You know, a friend that I have, and they ask right. me if the character's based on them, and I swear it's not. It's totally coincidence. Try not to do too much of that. That's that's funny because they would know right away. Exactly. You know, getting back to the thematic approach, you know, hitting on the the love and the romance mm-hmm. and being careful enough right, that you're giving a little taste of that that's in your books, along with hitting some of these issues like racism Mm -hmm. and the LGBT community Mm -hmm. and making sure that you have that. What kind of feedback do you get from parents who picked up your books and see these themes running through them? I I truly have had nothing but support, and I feel very lucky in being able to say that. Um, Mm -hmm. I know some feathers might be shaken over, you know, topics like that, but again, it's it's to show teens that there is a place for them, no matter who they are, what color they are, who they want to be with. Um, and so to me, that's just really important. So, so far, I, I feel very grateful that it's all been positive. <laughs> well, you know, that's not just for teens. Right, exactly, right? Of um, that, that could go for any of us. So I was reading your blog, and <laughs> you, you entitled it Escape Reality. Mm-hmm. And how come? Well, I, I just think that that's the biggest theme. I write to escape reality. I read to escape reality. And I hope I can provide the same for my readers. Hmm. And you take that into your reality sometimes, maybe, huh? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> How about drafts? Do you, do you ever, how many drafts do you do when you're looking at putting together a book or do they come right out and they're pretty clean? Um, I, so you have, you know, your pantsers and your plotters. So pantsers fly by the seat of their pants and, and they write as soon as it comes to their mind, right? Mm-hmm. Their, their fingers are flying. And I used to be a pantser and I found that that took me longer to write because I'm flipping too much. So now I'm a plotter and I outline and that keeps me a little more focused, even if characters decide to kind of go off the rails a little bit occasionally. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I really find that maybe three drafts is the minimum for me. Um, I edit as I go, which keeps it a little to the minimum, but I've had as many as, you know, seven or eight drafts, which some of my friends are just amazed by. (laughs) Well, and I read that you had like a hidden drawer and you would like put your drafts in that hidden drawer never to be seen again. Oh, so you still have a drawer like that. I probably have a couple still. Yeah. Some of those drafts, do they get pulled back out again? No. Oh gosh, no. Never see the light of day again. So who's your first read? Who's, well, whose eyes hit it first? That's probably my editor, who has been my best friend since I was 15. Um, you know, we were in high school together, and she's an English teacher now. She was an editor in a, in a past career. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's the first person who sees it, and, and she is definitely tough enough to give me the, the strong critique when it needs critiquing, where yeah. it needs critiquing. Um, but she also is very funny because her notes will be like, oh, my gosh, you know, and so she'll she'll be sure to note where things are working well for her as a reader. Yeah. Um, she, you know, teaches teens. And so she's also very aware of that culture and that community. So it's great to kind of have her finger on the pulse, too, because she can tell me nobody would ever say that or, mm-hmm. you know, this is great because of X, Y, Z. So that works out. How about your husband? Does he get does he get a read before they get published? You know, um, he is more than welcome to read them anytime he likes. But as a history teacher, he's more in line with biographies and nonfiction. Right. <laughs> Fiction and urban fantasy, which is okay. Yeah, that, sure, sure. So if you weren't writing and you weren't busy being an editor and you weren't running the these um, wonderful um, workshops and and the things that you're doing for um, the Writers' Conference, what would you be doing? Can I say stay-at-home dog mom? Sure. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's cool. No, that's a great question. Um, you know, I acting is tough, but I love the concept. I love the idea of screenwriting for movies and TV. Um, I think that yeah. would be, it's, it's not that far of a leap from what I'm doing now, but still mm -hmm. I think it would be just really cool to do that. Could you see adapting some of these for the big screen? I would love to adapt yeah. some of these. Honestly, <laughs> I would what love would to write first? a screenplay. Probably The Blood King. I yeah. feel it's timely. Um, and, and honestly, I think there are great ways to, you know, from first person perspective, you get that in the book, but in a screenplay, you get to talk about what other characters are doing and you see other sides of the story that might not be in the book from her perspective, mm -hmm. which I think is cool. Hmm. Who inspires you? Oh, gosh. Um, like as a writer or just in just general? Just in general. Um, I mean, it might be hokey, but I mean, my mom works harder than anybody I know. And so, you know, to see her work ethic is something that I've grown up with and something that I hope to carry on myself. Um, you know, somebody who is dependable and, um, and will always be there for you no matter what happens. So to me, I think that that's a pretty special person to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, what a wonderful, tender thing to say for her. Is she a writer also? No, no. So she works in healthcare, but she is the most organized, dedicated person I know. So it's certainly something to learn from. So how do you research when it's, you know, when you're looking at fantasy and uh, you must have this incredibly creative mind, but what type of research goes into character development or the scenes or the location? Sure. Well, locations is always fun. Um, so you might have noticed in a couple of the books that Roanoke is certainly an inspiration. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I was writing the superhero trilogy, which is Arcania, but of course it's Roanoke without saying it, um, I went and took pictures of everything. I, I walked around the Grandin neighborhood. I walked around downtown. Um, I went to certain areas that I knew would show up in the book. And so I would take pictures of those things. So that way when I'm writing, I can refer back and say, okay, mm -hmm. there's graffiti on this wall or this is how this building looks um, and then sort of create based off of that reality and so the world building is always really fun for me and then for researching um, as Hermione Granger would say when in doubt go to the library I, I research the mythology or you know Google is your really good friend when it comes to looking up you know character descriptions or you know when you're researching something like um, a mental illness you know you really want to get those details right so you don't mm -hmm. offend anybody and so that's really important to make sure that's accurate um, so let's let's move to um, the newest things that you have coming out, which is the duology, mm -hmm. um, the Blood King and the Golden City, and you put them both out in the same year. Yes. So when I was looking at the dates, I'm thinking, yes, she did. She got these <laughs> both out in 2018. Yes. And why did you want to do that? So because I'm self-published, I have that control, the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I have learned. So this makes books 11 and 12 for me. And so when I am interacting with readers, the first thing that they're going to ask when you end a book on a cliffhanger is when's the next one coming out. Mm -hmm. And I've learned my lesson there not to make them wait too long. Well, that's probably a good thing because then they're picking, <laughs> um, they're picking up both of them. Exactly. So when we look at this duology, there are some not so subtle hints or references to things you pluck right out of the headlines. Mm -hmm. And as people pick up the Blood King and first began to see that and see that unfold, um, was that purposeful? Did you, um, did you want readers to kind of draw modern day parallels by placing it in a fantasy type of environment? Yes. I mean, I think it would be, you know, I don't want to say no because it's pretty obvious, I think, once you really get into mm -hmm. it. Um, it was actually inspired by an article that a family member shared about, um, it was a scientific article a couple of years ago, um, rats and genes and blood and how they're using things for, for human research. See, and I would turn down reading an article like that. <laughs> if someone gave me an article, I'd be like, you know what, just why don't you read it and tell me about it. I didn't need pictures or anything. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was interesting. And so that sort of... Um, you know, spurned the idea and inspired me. And I said, well, what would happen if you apply that to real life in, in some sort of realistic situation? Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of just sort of snowballed from there. But certainly, um, you know, like we talked about with LGBT or, or, you know, racism or anything like that, those are topics that are incredibly important um, in, in any day, but especially today when, you know, the real world is dealing with so many of those issues. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of my way of saying I'm an ally, I support, you know, this, this group of people who might not be heard otherwise. Well, and there's also strong themes through here, like we talked about a few minutes ago, with belonging and trusting each mm -hmm. other. And that comes through really very clearly in both of these books. Good, that's wonderful So to hear. what was the inspiration behind this particular duology? 
Um, you know, I hate to say political, but you know, there is a little bit of a political theme inside. There is a bit of that science um, behind it. But again, it's, it's taking um, the everyday life of a girl who essentially lives in a ghetto and how do you, you know, how does she deal with it when an offer comes across that is so good and mm -hmm. so, um, it seems like a dream. It's too good to be true. What happens when that dream kind of falls apart and she sees the truth behind the lie? And, and so that's kind of where that snowballs. Yeah. Do you find it difficult bringing those topics to light in the book or do you find them more critical that you, you don't want to forget about it? You know, you don't want to leave it on the table. You really, you want to dig in there and right. you want to kind of shine the mirror on For it. For sure. And, and sort of, you know, we mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, but when I started writing this, you know, I typically might take eight months to write a, to write a novel, mm -hmm. um, let's say 90,000 words. I wrote The Blood King in probably three or four months, which is mm. very fast for me. But honestly, every time I sat down, I would sit down for four or five hours at a time and I would just crank out four to 5,000 words. And again, not necessarily unusual for a lot of writers, but for me, that's, that's certainly really moving at a fast pace. Mm -hmm. But I was almost compelled to get those words on paper before they could fall out of my head and I'd forget about mm -hmm. them. And yes, for me, it was it was moving so fast and it was so obvious to me where the story was going in my head that there was no way to avoid that, nor would I. Well, and, and it's, it's obvious when you read it and you pick it up and you can see how the king was once a president and you have his golden wall mm -hmm. and there's so many things that are twisting and turning while you're also weaving in this, like you said, this young girl from poverty and how they're brought into the city mm -hmm. for some time experimental, but believing that they're really getting this huge honor to be a part of this wonderful project and to elevate their status in society, mm -hmm. right? Right. Which is really interesting. So the second one, The Golden City, we leave the king, mm -hmm. we, things are beginning to unravel. And right. so you're going to be picking it up with The Golden City. Yes. Would you read for us? I absolutely would. I would love to. So this is going to be from um, a part of the first chapter from the Golden City. And as you stated, we, we just sort of ran away from the tower um, and, and Brighton. So Brighton is the name of the city. And so this is um, Reina Torres, uh, our narrator. And she's talking about what exactly has happened since she's left the Golden City. And it's from chapter one. I never wanted to be part of a revolution. I don't even know how I got here. It was a lie, of course, a whisper in the back of my mind, trying to comfort me whenever I realized the horror of the situation. I knew exactly how I'd gotten here, sitting with rebels on the outskirts of Brighton, our kingdom's golden city, King Magnus. The name would surely haunt me for the rest of my life, however long that lasted. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw blood, red and viscous and dripping onto white tile floor, my waking nightmare. It wasn't often, but once in a while, I could still feel sharp pricks in my arm, of needles sinking beneath my skin to take my blood for his life force. I'd jerk at the memory, rattling anyone around me. King Magnus and his key program. The king's education for youth. What a joke. My stomach twisted at how naive I'd been. My hopes and dreams, wrapped up in the king's promises, all shattered by his cruelty. I understood the way of my kingdom now. Getting everything you wanted cost a high price, one with no looking back. Once the blood was spilled, once the lives were lost, there were no peaceful thoughts, no time for timidness or fear. There was only justice and revenge, and sometimes the line between them was so blurred you couldn't tell the difference anyway. Which was why I was here, in this rebel base, sitting next to Princess Helena Brighton. On the surface, she was the king's daughter, but the truth was she'd been a prisoner, locked away like in some fairy tale. Her father wanted to marry her away to a rich ally, while he'd all but forced my own engagement to his petty, hateful son. All the while, Helena and I had been busy falling for each other. Helena believed me when I shared my nightmares of her father's bloodletting. She even went after whatever proof she thought could help save me. She'd been brave enough to try, which told me everything I needed to know. When that plan failed, we plotted our escape, never looking back on what might have been. We barely escaped her father's golden tower, the massive structure that doubled as the kingdom's nerve center. Helena had given up her entire life, much like I once had for key, and now that we both knew the truth about King Magnus, there would be no going back. At some point in the past few days, I'd changed. My thoughts had shifted from survival mode. Maybe the rebels were rubbing off on me. Now I wanted more than to merely live. I wanted a life. One with this brave young woman beside me, where we didn't have to hide or worry anymore. Instead of thinking, stay alive, now my thoughts screamed, save Helena. I had to do everything within my power to keep her safe, because if I was being honest with myself, I didn't think I could live without her. Mm. <laughs>
Thank you so much for sharing Thank that. You. I think you're carving out this great niche for the young adult in all of these books. Maybe a little escaping, but also hitting hard some really strong issues that not only kids, but a lot of us are dealing with, right? Yes, thank you. So what's next? I am currently working on a standalone, which, you know, I say that and then it turns into a series. Uh -huh. um, and so I, I love the gifted world, this, this super powered, mm -hmm. um, the transporter, you know, um, like we talked about. And so um, it's actually the, the thief and the spy. And so it's going to be a little bit of a heist and a spy uh, thriller mixed in together. Oh, set where? Um, well, I'm not going to say Roanoke, but probably Roanoke. Okay. <laughs> and how about the main? Who's, who's taking the lead this time? Um, it's actually going to be dual points of view. So we'll have the, the woman and the man telling their story. Oh, that'll be interesting. <laughs> so based on any particular characters, or are you just going to leave us? I no, I think I'll leave you hanging for now. <laughs> okay. Well, that'll be good. This has been wonderful. And thank you for the Prosecco. Thank you. That's Absolutely. always very nice. You've Cheers. been a joy. <laughs> uh, special thanks to Liz Long for inviting us here into her home to talk about all of her work, all of her work in young adult and also the Brighton duology. They're exciting books, and I know there's so much more to come from her. So, Liz, thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching. We can't do this without you. And make sure to tell your friends about us. I'm Rose Martin, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time right around the corner. Production funding for Right Around the Corner provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Anne Ray Foundation, and by viewers like you. Thank you.